Hi, my name's Dan. I hope you're doing well. In today's lesson, I'm just going to show you a few bases I use for sessions. And what you'll find is that a lot of session players, and these are people that get called to do different styles of music, they'll, they tend to have the same sort of gear. And this is by no means a hard and fast rule, but a lot of people have a P bass. So here I've got 1978 Maple. It's got a vintage sound to it. And that vintage tone is quite in fashion at the moment, but because a P bass was used in the 50s onwards, it's a sound that people have got used to, barring the 80s. The 80s is when bass playing went super, you know, uh, round wound stainless steel strings and bright sounds. Apart from that, before and after, you'll find that lots of people have a P bass. This is a 1968 P bass with flat wounds, and flat wounds give you a mellower, sort of even probably more vintage tone. And I sometimes like to think of tone as going from sort of dark to light. This is quite a dark tone. The 78 is a bit brighter. So what fits for the track that I'm doing? And honestly, I do, I've done over a thousand remote sessions over the last 10 years and most of the time people don't really stipulate what tone they want. They'll leave it up to you. But if you're in a studio, oftentimes they do. They, they might want a vintage sound. They might want something with a, you know, that's got a five string, more of that later. But you'll find that session musicians will have a few different bases to cover a few different tones. You know, does something need to sound a bit 60s? Well, this is going to be good for that. Recently, I played on The Serpent, which is on Netflix at the moment. And the composer Dominic Scherer, brilliant composer. He originally booked Dave Richmond, who's in his 80s now. He played on all the Serge Gainsbourg stuff and some David Bowie stuff. He lives in, in the UK. And the pandemic hit, so unfortunately Dave couldn't uh, travel to the studio, so Dominic asked me to do it. And he was very specific. He wanted a Burns Bison tone from about that era. And of all the basses I've got, I don't have a Burns Bison, so... It was a tricky one, what to do. Um, if you listen to that show, anything that's with a pick and flat rounds is me. There's a couple of other bass players, and I, I'll show you in a minute, but I've got a, uh, a JMJ Mustang Fender. And I, in the end, I used that with a plectrum, and that sounded pretty good. That sounded pretty close, but that's why I needed a bass that's got that sort of deep, dark, vintage sound. Um, you need to be able to play with a plectrum, I needed to be able to recreate that tone. And that's about as specific as anyone's ever been with me. You know, a Burns Bison from the 60s era. And I couldn't get it exact, but I, I had enough in the, in the toolbox to be able to approximate that tone. If I need something a bit punchier, a bit beefier, I've got this 78 Music Man. really good for that sort of funky Bernard Edwards finger style. If I grab a plectrum here. Now just because I started sort of collecting a few more affordable vintage bases years and years ago, that's the bulk of my collection sort of is that. But what you'll find is sometimes you'll need a more modern sound. So I'll just show you one of those basses now. Can't really call this modern. I bought this in 2003 and it's second hand, but this is a five string Music Man Stingray. It's just got an, I'm really familiar with this bass. This is the one I use most live and actually more and more for recording. It's really good for rock. I did a rock album recently and a lot of the stuff was below E. You know, a lot of this is down to technique. If you play like that, sounds a bit more rocky. You can make it sound however you want it, really. They're quite versatile. So if ever I need anything below E, I'll use this. But I've got another five string here I'll show you. This is a great bass. This is a Zoot Funkmeister made by Mike Walsh from Essex in England. Brilliant luthier. And um, I had this sort of custom made for me. And it's got brand new strings on it, so... 
get that brighter, zingier tone. That's what I was talking about before when you have dark tones and light tones. This is passive and active, so at the moment it's passive. It's got a really good B string. So those two basses, this one in particular, they're probably my, my most modern basses. I've got so many basses, but I probably I wouldn't say no to, to a, maybe one more modern tone, maybe a real, real zingy rock tone, but this, this covers that pretty well, actually. It's probably completely down to the McCartney influence, but a hollow body bass, nothing makes a hollow body sound like a hollow body bass. You know, you can't really approximate this tone with a, with a P bass. <laughs> This is a 30 inch scale and, you know, people use Les Paul basses, they use um, even now what you've got, Duesenbergs, you've got lots of different types of hollow body basses, but a Hofner is a pretty classic one. This isn't an old one, this is actually a new, I don't know where it's made actually, um, probably, probably China, probably one of the Chinese ones, but I'm actually waiting for some pyramid strings, I'm going to do another video on this, because these at the moment are round, round wound. <laughs> You want to play differently on this bass because the spacing's different, the scale length is different, it just has a completely different vibe and that's that's important because if you need something that sounds like genre or era specific or makes you play in a different way then you, you need a different bass and this covers all that sort of old school 60s tone. <laughs> Fretless has its own complete unique sound and you need one because every now and again a request will come up for a fretless and I was lucky enough to buy this off Pino Palladino. It was being sold at the Bass Gallery in Camden years ago and I bought it. And just anything that I need that's fretless, this works. It's uh, again um, passive, active, got two pickups here. I pretty much have it set the way it is now actually and that's that's mostly how I, how I use it. But you'll find that most session players have a fretless for those few occasions where you need to play one. So when I do remote sessions, I'll usually go bass into an Avalon U5 DI, which goes into a Universal Audio Apollo, and that goes straight into Logic. And what I'll do is I'll take a throughout of the, of the U5, which is a clean, transparent DI. That's just the sound of the bass. That's how I record all these YouTube videos. I don't put any compression or any EQ on for YouTube videos. And when I record, I also do the same thing because when you're sending tracks to people around the world, the bass is going to go into a mix and you don't, you, don't want to, you don't want too much on it. You don't want EQ, you don't really want too many effects on it. So I send a very clean signal to give them complete freedom when they're mixing. I'll then take a, a, a throughout of the U5. I've got an Ampeg, a 1966 Ampeg. I've got this thing here which I think is 1973 Fender Bass Man. And these days I'll often have the second channel, what usually was traditionally the case, James Jameson went straight to the mixing desk and that's and it was slightly overdriven to give you to give that sort of harmonic saturation that sits well in the mix. So I'll usually try and aim for something like that in the second channel, if you like. Whether that's through an amp or through a plug-in or through you know, a sans amp or something like that. The second channel, I try to have a bit more character in it. And if, if someone that's employed me to play for them doesn't want that, they don't use it. They just use the clean one and they can do what they like to that. They can reamp it, they can do whatever. When you're recording with whatever bass you're recording, people want you to play in time. They want the performance to be great and obviously everything to be in tune as well. It's actually pretty simple, but you will find that, you know, you listen to Chris Cheney, or Sean Hurley, or Justin Meldal Johnson. It, it occurs to me as I'm saying these people that all of those have got good deals with Fenders. That's probably why they play them. But a lot of session players do have Fender type basses or Sadowski, something that's a bit familiar, something with that tried and tested tone. But look, they're all set up well. There are no buzzes. They know how to play them. The main thing is just to get your skills up so that if you're in the studio or if you're coming up with bass lines that you can make up a decent bass line. That, by the way, is mostly what I do on my channel. So if, you, if you're interested in learning about how to play the bass, then, you know, subscribe to my channel. I've shown you the main tools of my trade here. I've got a double bass. I've got an electric upright. I've got an acoustic bass. 
But these are the sort of main bases that pay the bills, really. And actually, you could probably whittle these down into, into two. Probably use the Stingray and the probably the 78 and, uh, P bass and Music Man, probably the most. But if you've got any questions a bit more about that gear, let me know. But really, what I do on this channel is to teach you how to play the basses, you know, in in different genres and with good taste and timing. That's really what it's all about. So if you're interested in that, please do subscribe to the channel. If you've got any questions about that gear, let me know. I will be doing more gear videos. I'm doing I'm going to do some string videos soon, uh, a bit more about the amps. But that's kind of my my setup for for home recording anyway. It's based around those bases and a very simple sort of good DI and, and a second channel. That's really it. So thanks very much for watching. See you on the next video.